Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to be together. And Lord, we're just going to believe for revelation that would just affect and change our lives. Lord, that step us into a place of walking in victory and and seeing you released into our lives in measures and ways that we've never had before. So, Lord, we just thank you for this time. Lord, I just want to ask and declare in the name of Jesus, Lord, that no spirit of darkness may interfere in any way, shape, or form. Lord, I just pray protection around us and our families. Just give your angels charge over us to guard us in all our ways. And so, Lord, we just uh, declare this place holy and righteous, and you're exalted. You're the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So, Father, we just thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, okay, well, let's real quick, just sort of launching out. We're dealing with spiritual warfare. We're dealing with power and authority. So let's go to, uh, go to, go to launch everything off. Let's go to, to uh, James chapter 4, verse 7, which, or I, you know, just, I'll just quote it. It's one we looked at before. Real simple, basics of spiritual warfare. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he must flee. So before you start resisting the devil, we do what? Submit to God. And so we established before that Jesus operated in power and authority. So submitting submission is a is a is an authority principle. Um, so look at a, go with me to Second Corinthians chapter ten, verse five and six. Uh, we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Sorry, you read three and four. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. So we're talking about spiritual warfare, okay? And that so we're destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, taking every thought captive. To the beings of Christ. Verse 6, Q, read it. And we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever our, your obedience is complete. Now, one thing that I found to be true, y'all, is if we're going to do a spiritual warfare, there's a principle that of our obedience being complete. So last week we talked about responses to authority because our responses to authority determines uh, how we walk in authority. You remember, the, and also how we how we operate in power. You remember the Roman centurion uh, when he came to Jesus. He says, "I too am a man under authority. Say the word, and my servant will be healed." So, so we talked about different responses. Authority. These are the positive responses. Authority. Submit means to order under. Obedience. There's two facets of it. Was hupakuo uh, here under? Uh, and the other one is, and this one's like absolute. It's spoken, you do it. Uh, Pytho is persuasion. It's based on persuasion. And uh, and then honor. And then, then we got in this whole thing about the negative response to authority. That's where we got in a whole lot of cool discussion. We talked about this thing, antitasso, that, that's the deal where you order your heart against. Oh, no, back up. All of this is in relationship to the heart. You know, Romans 6, 17, where it talks about we became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching. So we can physically deal with, and that's where Paula's testimony last week was really cool, is we can be physically obedient and still get our butts kicked in spiritual warfare. So um, uh, we're also physical, too. I mean, I mean, in some some area. So, and then we deal with this deal with Mare, which we're dealing with, uh, with Apitho, which is unwilling to be persuaded, is a stubbornness. And then Parakue, which talks, the basic meaning was to hear amiss, to be dis disobedient, correct. You sort of hear it and put it aside. That's sort of what I was, after just praying about it, just sort of realizing, it, you know, so you, Somebody speaks something, you just take it and you set it aside. Instead of take hearing it and putting yourself under it, you just hear it and put it to the side. Because notice what it says. It's para, 
Kue, hearing alongside. Or rather than hearing amiss, that's what the basic definition of they, the lexicon was that I was using, but it's just literally you just hear it and put aside. All right. So give me the, just, just go through real quick the English of one, two, uh, A and number three. <laughs> Because I just want, I just want to throw it in there. So the first one was what it was like, like a resistance. resisting, resisting. And a good verse would have been Romans thirteen two. He who resists authority receives a condemnation to himself. And mere is the Hebrew word for rebellion and stubbornness. stubbornness. This gets in the Hebrew. It's in its first first. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23 and 24. And then the other is, is, is Apitha. Refuse to be persuaded. It's just refuse to be persuaded. And a good one of that is, is um, Romans one thirty or also uh, Luke one seventeen. And then uh, the last one is, it's Paracuae. That's what we were just talking about, 2 Corinthians 10 6. So we're ready to punish every bit disobedience when our obedience is complete. You know, I, let me stop with this. We're talking about here, this is the ultimate form of disobedience. You hear it, put it aside. Think about this how crucial. Hearing is in the gospel. Faith comes by hearing. Let him who has ears to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying. That's seven times to the churches in, in First Corinthians. Jesus says it a couple of times in the gospels. So this thing about hearing is crucial. And so to hear and put it aside is really, really deadly. So, so cool. Now, what, let me just tell you this also. What we have not shown here, this is dealing with types of authority and how we res should respond to this particular type of authority because every type of authority has a different response. Okay? So, and we'll sh I'll show you these, like the, the response that we have toward um, God is different than the response that we're to have to a religious leader like myself, like with you. Okay. My, I'm an abstract leader here. Okay. So I've got authority, but your response to God is different than your response to me. And so, so, so that's what we want to look at tonight. These different types of authority and how we respond to it. Now, here's the interesting thing. Let me tell you what we have not discussed, which we will next. What we haven't shown is, is how God gives authority and how he believes, how he expects authority to function. Positive effects of authority. One of the things that we looked at come, talking earlier was about how the negative effects of authority, how authority can be abused, how authority can be transferred. You know, so, so there's negative facets to exercising authority, which we have not talked about. And the reason why I'm doing this is because a lot of times our response to authority is in relationship to if the authority is good. But that is not to be the case. Let me give you two examples, scripture examples. First Corinthians, I mean, first Peter chapter one, verses three, verses chapter three, verses one through three, where it says, wives, submit to your husbands, even if they are disobedient to the word, that they may be won by the behavior of their wives. So husbands disobedient to the word. Submit. Um, then, then another example is, is Romans 13, 2, 
where it talks about the, you know, 13, 1 and 2, where there's no authority given except by God. And then it goes on to say, he who resists authority receives condemnation to himself. Well, y'all, if you look at that context, that's written to the book of Romans. And so we're talking about probably one of the worst, not the worst, but not too, not too good. All right. <laughs> so, so anyway, so I want to show these types of authority apart from us having to put this expectation. Well, if they do it right, then I'll listen, I'll submit, I'll whatever. Because here's the crazy thing is, when we are obedient or whatever, we, we loosen the power of God to work on our behalf. So let's look at some of it. So obviously the two types of authority. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And first one is obviously the first type of authority is God. But then what I want to do is, is I'm going to break this down a second. God the Father. Now, you'll look at this, look at this past scripture. Kind of crazy to look at it and think about it. Somebody read 1 Corinthians eleven three. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. God the Father is the head of Christ. Now I could show you other past scriptures that talks about he is the sovereign ruler over all. God the Father. But here's a place that and where Jesus himself submits. That's what we're going to talk about here. Jesus, son of the most high God. The really crazy cool thing is, is I want you to watch this. Notice, uh, notice in Matthew 28, 18, one that y'all all know, but notice the statement that is said there. And Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So God, the father has given Jesus all authority. Now that is a tricky statement. And I'll show you that. We'll look at that in a second. Just I said that's a tricky statement. Let me just take that and put it on the side. But all authority God the Father has given to Jesus. So let's look at this real quick. quick. Go, to, go to Philippians chapter. I just want to show you this response. Jesus' response to God the Father. This is, this is the ultimate past scripture too. To start at 2 6. Read 5 through 8, please. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, Keep going. but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in, in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Get this. Notice the authority that's, uh, that's used in relationship. I mean, the response that's it's in relationship to Jesus. Obedient. Now, this is really crazy cool to me. The heart of Jesus. All authority has been given to him. Now, I know. So all authority has been given to him here, y'all. But yet, still, he does what? He's obedient to the Father, even to the point of death, even death on the cross. I think it's in, I may be wrong on this, John chapter 14. I think it's 14 or 12. I'm sorry. But it makes a statement about Jesus. Jesus says, I do exactly as my Father says to do. Wasn't... um Jesus being given like all authority, that was the result of like his response, right? Living 
how he lived that's what granted that's what or i guess caused the father to give him all authority right judicially to impart ye sure yeah yeah because and you're you're exactly right in that but jesus knew where he was going he knew where he was going, but I'm saying we hadn't been given all authority oh, until yeah. he lived that full yeah. obedient life. And even, and here's the other one thing that goes along with what you're saying, Q, it's really good you're saying this. Hebrews chapter 5, it says that Jesus learned obedience. What? Through the things he suffered. Yeah, and the things he suffered. The Son of God learns obedience. Come on. What in the world? Was that, was that part of like Philippians 2 where he emptied himself and he basically was a man? Yeah. And so he had to rely upon the Holy Spirit just like we do. Yep. Yep, yep. yep, yep. So his response, obedient to the point of death, even death on his cross, his response to God the Father. Also, we know this, that he submitted and also, we know that he honored. Uh, there's other past scriptures talking about honor, and I didn't put those in here. He submitted. We know that. We just looked at he, 1 Corinthians 11, 3. You know. But, uh, but then there's a passage in John. It talks about how Jesus honors the Father. So, so this response of honor, uh, Jesus just operated in all in relationship to the Father. John 8, 49. Jesus says, I honor my father. You dishonor me. So, so anyway, so it's really interesting, this whole thing. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to show you the second sphere of authority. And, and it, it will, it will create a, a rabbit. First Corinthians seven thirty seven. But he who stands firm in his heart, being under no constraint, but has authority over his own will, and has decided this in his own heart to keep his own virgin daughter, he will do well. Okay. We have authority, exosia, over our own will. Okay. So we got authority over this. Now we got authority over our own will. However, I don't want to, what I want to look at real quick is BC in relationship to us. And at salvation. Now, y'all, if I don't mind, let me just quote these so we can go faster. You remember last week we talked about two past scriptures. Colossians 1.13. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. So BC, that word for domain, is the Greek word for... Let me just keep going to it. Let me just write it up here. Exosia, meaning authority. So, so before we're saved, we are under the authority of Satan. And I like what it says there, rescued us. So our will is being subverted under the slavery of Satan, B.C. Now, I want you to notice the authority that I haven't written up here yet. Because there's another th authority here and that's, that's, that really I need to put in here, but I don't want to really give them much honor, and I'm going to write it right here, is... Well, the devil and his angels. So, you remember last week that we talked about how three times? Remember John twelve thirty, fourteen, um, John John twelve thirty one, fourteen thirty, and sixteen eleven. Three times Jesus calls Satan the ruler of this world. Paul calls him the God of this world. 1 John 5, 18 says, We're of God, little children. The whole world is under the power of the evil one. Literally under the evil one. And so 
not knowing Jesus, we're under the authority of Satan. Remember, Jesus, Satan tempts Jesus in Luke 4, and he says, you know, shows him all the kingdoms of the world a moment of time, and he says, you know, I'll give you this and all its authority, for it has been handed over to me. Adam and Eve handed that authority over to him when they sinned. And um, so you, let me just describe this. You go, well, how did Adam and Eve give him authority? Psalms, the heavens are the heavens of the Lord. The earth he has given to the sons of men. So when God, you know, created Adam and Eve, really Adam, in Genesis 1, 26 to 28, he gave them all authority over the earth, both physically, physical realm, and spiritual realm. The angels, both rulers and authorities, were under the authority of Adam. And they were to help serve. And I could show you those past scriptures. That's a whole other rabbit we don't want to chase. But when Adam, so when they sinned, that authority got transferred over. And here's how, here's an example of how it can happen in physical. Let's imagine this. I own a million dollars worth of real estate. So I, and I hire somebody to do manage my properties so i need i want to take a trip to europe so so i'm going to go to europe and so so and i'm gonna be out of con out of out of touch so i'm going to give this guy power of attorney over my property so he can do business with it and take care of it while i'm gone well power of attorney he can do whatever we want to with it so imagine back in say this was before like 2006 when the uh, real estate market was really hot, you could finance something like over like 120% of the value. In other words, so he goes to a bank. He's got my property free and clear of debt. He goes to a bank and he says, hey, I, want, I got property here, good value, million dollars worth of property. I want to finance it. So the bank gives him $1.2 million. Boom, he gets $1.2 million. And the bank puts a mortgage on my property. So guess what? They've got authority on my property. So this guy skips the country. $1.2 million. He's got it. I come back from Europe. And you're stuck with the mortgage. I'm stuck with a mortgage. That is exactly what happened with Adam and Eve. They mortgaged the earth. That's why the old story, not the story, the uh, in the in the Old Testament, the kinsman redeemer. Jesus is the kinsman redeemer. We mortgage mankind, mortgage the earth. So Jesus comes back to satisfy a debt that he did not create. So that's how this whole authority gets there. Now, Jesus makes a statement, all authority's been given to me. But is it? Go to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 8. And this, is, this is where, in essence, where spiritual warfare really, really takes off. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. Hear the statement? You put all things, all things in subjection under his feet. Okay, but watch this. For in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. But now we do not yet see all things subjected to him. See, that's not a statement. Everything's subjected to him, but everything's not yet subjected to him. What does it what does that mean? Totally. Well, first off is I'll ask you this. A dude across the street. Don't know Jesus. Is he subjected to Jesus? No. That's in relationship to him. How about how about Satan? Is he subjected to Jesus? 
now. What is the timing of that? Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 23. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, after those who are Christ at his coming. Oh, then comes the end when he hands over the... Then comes the end, y'all. The end is what? Catch this. When he hands over the kingdom to God the fa to God to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. So now watch this next statement. It's a huge statement. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. So so Jesus, all authority has been given to him. And he's ruling until he puts all his enemies, literally, here and here, under his feet. The last enemy to be abolished, and that Greek word for abolished there, literally means to be rendered powerless. Now, think about this. Jesus says in the first part of Revelations, um, I've been given the keys of death and Hades. Now, but we do not yet set, see death yet subjected to him. Let me ask you a couple of questions. Why do we, why do we know that is true? Scientifically. Huh? Because people still die. Okay. The, the last week, did I, uh, we were talking about judgment. I think we talked about judgment. And did we talk about, did somebody ask the question, why does God not go ahead and just judge Satan and everything 100% wipe him out right now? Did we talk about that? No, we didn't. It's really important you catch this. Okay. The last enemy to be abolished, he will rule to he must he must reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be abolished is death. When is death abolished? Somewhere at the end of the book. There's some type of throne and a judgment and a pit. That's all I got. It is Revelation chapter 20. Great white throne of judgment. The Antichrist. I think Hades was a being. It is. It is. Hades is a being. Two things. And a place. And it's a place. Death is a condition, and death is a spirit. It's both. It's it's 1920. And the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. So the beast and the false prophet are the first two that are thrown into the lake of fire. They're saying that the last two were definitely? No, the last two. The, the next two. The next two were definitely. <laughs> are... Well, really, the next the next one is 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 Satan, where he gets loosed in twenty chapter twenty verse seven, and then um, verse ten, the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and false prophet are. So that is hell. Let me just say this. Matthew 25, 41 says this. It talks about how hell was prepared for the devil and his angel. Isn't it? Wait, isn't the difference like between Gehenna and the lake of fire, right? So isn't... No, Gehenna is the lake of fire. lake of fire, okay. There's a difference between Gehenna and Hades. Okay. 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 Hades is a place of torment in the center of... It's a place, before Jesus died on the cross, it was two places. It was a place that was divided by a, a chasm of torment and comfort. Luke 16, mm -hmm. Lazarus and the rich man. So but if, if when sinners die today, or they, they go to Hades. They go to Hades. Torment. Okay. 
Because right. notice this, go to 20, verse 11 through 14. Then I saw a great white throne, and with and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and the books were open, and another book was open, which, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the book according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. Uh, and they were judged, every one of them according to their deeds. Did we get a revelation there? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess people just say well, you're going to Hades. I guess. <laughs> how can if Hades is hell? How can Hades be thrown into it, though? So, so, in fact, it's interesting that King James will trans it translates Hades hell, and that's where it'll cause a lot of confusion. That's where it. That's where it got goofy. Death and Hades are thrown into the lake of fire. And uh, and then, then verse fifteen is anyone's name that was not written in the Lamb's book of life is thrown into the lake of fire. Jesus, it says that Jesus is ruling till he puts all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be abolished is death. Okay, here's my question: Why is death the last enemy to be abolished? And not Satan. And here's the other question. While you're turning to Matthew chapter 13. Why is it not Satan? Why is it death? In 24. I'll, if you don't mind, I'm going to read it here because I'm going to stop and start. Kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in the field, in his field that later on you'll find out is Jesus. While his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. The interesting thing is that Greek word for tares literally means darnels. And it's interesting, a darnel it looks just like wheat, just like wheat. And the only way that you can tell the difference between wheat and the darnel is when it comes to the fruit. When it there's, it's, that's the only thing that differentiates it. A darnel is fruitless, and wheat has wheat. So, so anyway, let's go. The, but when the wheat sprouted and bore grains, the tares became evident also. Okay, sprouted and bore grain, bore fruit. The tares became evident. That's when it became evident. Okay. The slaves of the landowner came and said, Sir, do not sow good seed. Did, did, you, did you not sow good seed? How then is it, does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? Now, this is huge, y'all. Do you want us to go gather up the tares? Notice what he says. He said, No. For while you are gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. What in the world is he saying? Okay. Got three or four streams here. I ask you a question. This why is death the last enemy to be abolished and not Satan? Okay. Then, then the next question is, if... It, why doesn't Jesus go ahead and just wipe out Satan right now? Well, y'all, God is absolutely just. He cannot execute justice in one place and not execute justice in another. He's absolutely just. The foundations of his throne are justice and righteousness. Now, so, so if God, if Jesus declares absolute judgment on Satan and executes it. Now, there's a difference between declaring a judgment and executing the judgment. There are big difference. Uh, one of the most interesting times, 1991, when, when Iraq invaded Kuwait, the United Nations and the United States executed a judgment on Saddam Hussein, declaring for him to get out 
of Kuwait, we declared judgment on Saddam Hussein. And that's what he said. And I remember President Bush, he makes a statement. We do not have a problem with the Iraqi people. We declaring judgment, declaring, I can't remember the term he used, but on Saddam Hussein, and we will, we will execute it. So that happened in like the fall of, of, of 90. In 91, in January, January or February of 91, then all of a sudden, I'll never forget that night where they said the deadline. And the question was, is there anything going to happen? Well, the next thing we know, all HCLL breaks loose on a, over Iraq. You know, desert storm. So judgment was declared here, executed here. Judgment has been declared over Satan and over death. It's executed here. Now, why the gap? Well, the gap in 91, 991 is the place where you get back. Ezekiel 26 says, God, it says that God does not delight in the death of the wicked, that the wicked would repent. So, Everybody here, you know, our will and PC were under the authority of Satan. So if God executes judgment on Satan, he must execute judgment on every person that does not know Jesus as our Lord and Savior at that very moment. We were going to one of the doctor's appointments today and she she, we were talking about what was going on over in the Middle East. And she said, I see a lot on Facebook where people are saying, you know, please, Jesus, come now. She said, but, you know, I don't think I, I don't want to pray that. And I said, you don't. How come? She said, because if he comes and the people that don't know him don't have a chance to know him. That's exactly right. And I'm like, You're right. Mom. That's exactly right. But then why does he release him after a thousand years? I was going to wonder that. I'll say it this way. I, I, I will say that this way. If 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 God does Revelations twenty ten before, um, now it's going to be crazy. I'm going to say this, and I'm thinking passage of scripture. So if he if he does a Revelations twenty ten before the time before. Every person that was ever purposed to be born was born. He's committing spiritual abortion. Psalms 139, verse, verses 15, how it tells, says that we were skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. In other words, your names were written in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundations of the world. Your works, created works, were created before the foundations of the world. You were predestined to be conformed. I mean, that you would should be holy and so you were chosen in him before before the foundations of the world that you would be holy and blameless. So before the world was, before God said, let there be light, in the mind of God, we existed. But when he said he created the world and said, let there be light, guess what? We're in the middle of it. Romans chapter 8 that how, how creation is suffering the pains of what? Childbirth even into now. So creation will be, be set free, if you read it, when it's set free is literally is when the sons are come forth. And to answer your question, that's what, what I would say. Spiritually, you and I were created in the fabric of the earth before the foundation of the world. We were in the DNA, the fabric of the earth. So you're saying that he he has to be released. He, who's he? That's what he was talking about. Satan has to be released after the end of the thousand year reign. Well, That's what he was asking about. <laughs> well, the reason why is, is that this, I'm saying it this way. 
You're going to hear my theology right now real quick. Cross. Times of the Gentiles. Seven years of wrath and judgment. Do not call it tribulation. It's not tribulation. It's wrath and judgment. This is this is a season of tribulation. Okay, so after the end of seven years of wrath and judgment, Satan is bound for a thousand years. But guess what? Jesus rules and reigns there. During this period of time, guess what? Guess what's happening? People are still being born, People living? Still being born. But is there still sin? No, not while Jesus is reigning. Well, it's still, it's still, yeah, because Satan is loose. Yeah. Right. Because what happens to the end of a thousand years? Yeah, but I'm saying, but I'm saying, but during that thousand years, there's no sin, right? And still in the fabric of the world. Because he deceives, Satan's loose and he deceives the nations. But I'm saying during that thousand year period. He rules with a rod of iron. Okay. I mean, Donnie? Yeah, 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 yeah. Because, I mean, sin and death are not dealt with until Revelations 2010. Right here. This is when the great white throne judgment occurs. And this is when new heaven and new earth. Here, sin is judged. So, so he's to released to ultimately give choice to those born during those times. Is that what you're saying? And they, they I, and, and here's the crazy thing is, go to Revelation 20, verse 1. But then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. Okay, wait a minute. Wait, wait, let me just ask you a question. All that's happened at this point in time is Jesus has just come to earth. And he's come to earth and he stepped foot on the earth. And we're there with him ruling. So there's no been, re there's no, nothing new happening here except a new ruler has taken over on the earth. And so, in fact, in fact, that's why as soon as verse 20 hits, guess what? Okay, keep going. Verse one. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. Keep going. And he laid hold of the dragon, the old, the serpent of old, who was the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him, so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. Deceive the nations not any longer until. After these things, he must be released for a short time. But why? Why must he be released for a short time? That's that. Well, keep going. Then I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and the judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus, and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received the mark on their on their forehead or on their hand, and they came to life and, and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. I don't, there's a lot in here. I don't. That, don't ask me because I have to tell you, I have no revelation. <laughs> but keep going, kids. The rest of the dead did not come to life until a thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Okay, verse 7. When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, and to gather them together for war. The number of them is like the sand on the seashore. So all of a sudden, guess what? People are deceived. So when the so y'all, what's happened is is I mean, you've gone you've gone through this seven years right here. And at the end of this seven years, Jesus comes back to earth. The armies of the earth gathered together in Armedigo, 
he shows up and kicks butt against the armies. But y'all, there are people all over the earth that are still in existence. So the Antichrist is, is taken out of the way. And so all these people are still, still in existence. They're still living. He didn't wipe out the earth. So the, so, and so, so at the end of that seven years, then this thousand year thing starts happening. And the only, only thing that I can piece cue, this is why I said what it was said, is that, and I may be wrong, so call, call a lie, you know, really call this a lie. It's the only thing that makes sense to me is your question is, why would he do that? And the only thing is to, that my understanding is there's a point in time for everyone. There's a time to be born, time to die. These people's time does not manifest until here to be born. But the when he throws like the false prophet in Christ, there's still people alive who took the mark of the beast, right? Or... Well, but they're gone. The penalty for that is gone. Okay. There's people who worship the beast. Yeah. Are still around. Yes. So, but they're but they're not going to be thrown to the lake of fire just yet until they die. Evidently. Okay. Evidently, I I don't know a verse about that. I don't know a verse about that. But answering Tim's question, Tim's question about spiritually, I was talking about spiritual abortion. If, if let's just say it this way: if what I said is true, that there are people here to be, their time to be born is here. If God ends the show here, those those people who were purposed to be born, were never born. That is a spiritual abortion. I mean, that makes sense. But I'm just like, well, then I'm just, well, of course, I mean, Jesus could have bound Satan like 2,000 years ago after the cross, right? And then just avoided all this. Maybe that's a tangent. But anyways. <laughs> <laughs> he could have. But that's what I said a while ago. He could have, and but he had to execute judgment on these. On us. Yeah, but I'm saying but when he when Satan is bound, he hasn't executed judgment on Satan to be thrown in like a fire. He's just bound him. That's a good point. I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it's to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You messed me up, Q. <laughs> so, so, I don't know. That's a good question. That's a good point. I don't want to say that's not a question. That's a point. But anyway, get back into this. I do know this. Go back with me to 1 Corinthians 15. Let's pick back up where Q is reading. Acts 26, 18 first. Yep, a couple of verses. You get the whole context. And I said, who are you, Lord, and Jesus? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet for this purpose I have appeared to you, to appoint you a minister and a witness not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things which will, which, in which I will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God. Okay, so Paul's commission is that he's preaching the gospel and he is he is. People are turning from darkness to light from the authority of Satan to God. They're declaring, how are we saved? God, God purposed in Philippians 2 and Romans 15 that every knee would bow and every tongue would what? Confess. What? That Jesus is the Lord. And so what we do is we exercise the authority over our will and we declare, Jesus, you're my Lord, and we're transferred. We respond, and really under this our will, I should put response here, it's obedience, it's submission, and honor to this, to him. So we transfer that authority, okay? That's a transfer of authority. That's what, that's what it says. We're transferred from the authority of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. So when we minister the gospel, it is a spiritual war of 
transferring people from the authority of darkness into the kingdom of the beloved son, both in two ways. One is in the area of people being saved, but also when people get delivered of spiritual oppression. It's, it's, an, it's all it is, is an authority thing and a power thing. And we'll talk about power later. Now let's go back to the 1 Corinthians 15. 25 through 26. Now, all right, now, can I ask you to get this in your head? The Hebrews 2 8 passage, where it says, All things have been put in subjection to him, but we do not yet see all things subjected to him. So he's ruling and reigning until he puts everything under his feet. That's what he's doing right now. He is ruling and reigning until he puts everything under his feet. But watch this. Okay, keep start 25 and keep reading. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that, sh that will be abolished is death. For he has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is evident that he is expected, accepted, accepted who put all things in, subjected, in subjection to him. What is he saying there? It's what he's saying is, he said, everything's of subjection to him. But it's evident that the one who subjected everything to him, him, is not subjected to him. God the Father subjected everything to Jesus. But when it says that everything's subjected to Jesus, it is evident or accept, realize uh, that he is the one who is not subjected to jesus oh yeah because watch keep reading when all things are subjected to him stop who's to him there god the father uh, no jesus, no, jesus, jesus. Plus this. then the son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him because so that god all things to him that's god the father so that God may be all in all. So everything, it's really kind of crazy to me. This is, the, this is creation in reverse. 1 Corinthians 8 talks about how everything came out of God the Father through, it uses everything out of, this is God, this circle is God the Father. This pipe coming out of the middle of God the Father is Jesus. And it literally says, it says that, God the Father, one God the Father, out of whom all are all things, one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things. So everything came out of the Father through Jesus in creation. But then it's interesting to me that everything everything's going back through Jesus into God the Father. So what, what, reason why I went into this deal, y'all, is that this is, this is spiritual warfare. This is the foundation of it. But it's also important for us to realize that there is a timing of how things are judged and dealt with by the finality. Like, for example, death. And that you and I had a lot of really interesting discussions on this in relationship to healing, physical healing. And, and there's still, I still some things I don't totally understand. But I do know, what I do know that what we're doing right now, we are participating with Jesus to put everything under his feet. And y'all, here's the crazy thing is, everybody in this neighborhood here, everybody on that university out there, everybody in this new river has a destiny to be brought out of the authority of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. And that's what we're doing here. Well, how we respond? Well, here we respond 
by Romans 10, 9, declaring lordship and becoming obedient. Romans chapter 10. In fact, no, I'm sorry, not Romans chapter 10. Go to Romans 6. Start at verse 17. But then I'm going to read backwards. Not read backwards, but go back to some verses before it. Watch this. Hey, now, y'all, can I ask y'all a favor? Both online and here. If there's something you don't understand, it's not clicking, stop me. Or it's come back to it. Okay? It's critical we understand this and put all the pieces together. All right. We're talking here about types of authority and then responses to authority. So we showed the authority of Jesus in relationship to God the Father. God the Father gave authority to Jesus, but he's accepted. He's not, he's not submitted to Jesus. Jesus is submitted to him, 1 Corinthians eleven three. 3. Y'all, we with me on that? This is the coolest thing about the Trinity, man. They are awesome. They're really cool how they operate. Jesus' response to the authority of God the Father was become obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. He submitted to Jesus, 1 Corinthians eleven three. 3. He honors the Father, what was that, John chapter 8, verse 43, or something like that. So that's Jesus' response to God the Father. That is an authority. We have authority over our own will. B.C., we don't know Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We're under the authority of darkness. To get saved, I mean, in this BC state, notice this in 1017. But thanks be to God, though you were, what? Slaves of sin. Slaves of sin. You were a slave of sin. You became obedient from the heart Obedient from the heart to that form of teaching, the lordship of Jesus, declaring his lordship in our lives. Now, y'all, here's a crazy thing. Can I just say this to you? We keep using the term obedience. I think in Romans 14, 26, calls faith. It says it like this, the obedience of faith. In other words, faith and obedience are the same thing. You just said uh, faith and obedience were the same thing. You quoted a verse. I can't remember. Romans, Romans 16, 26, I believe it is. And Romans 5, 1, 5 says the same thing. Obedience of faith. So here's a crazy statement. Let me, let me ask a question. What's the test of faith? In the spiritual realm, what is the test of faith? Obedience. Here's a crazy statement. Obedience to what for Jesus was the test? The point of death. Revel, what does Revelation 12 say? They overcame him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and they do not what? Death. He didn't take up his cross and follow me. Is not worthy of it. Crazy. We're talking about response with our will to the authority of God. 616, do you not know when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? Either sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. Submission either of sin Slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death 
or obedience resulting in righteousness. What am I saying? No. You're going to obey something. You're going to obey something, but what are we really obeying? People are saying, oh, yeah, Jesus is my Lord. Well, go with me to Matthew 7, 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Keep going. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from the bushes, from from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can the bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. You'll know them by their fruit. 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 What kind of fruit? Not going to answer it yet, but what kind of fruit? Okay, go ahead, Q. Keep going. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everybody who says it, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Keep going. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Does the will of my Father. Obedience of faith. Keep going, Q. Watch this. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I never knew you. What am I saying? You know, well, and, and this went a little deeper than I was anticipating. But y'all, in, in, in our evangelical Christianity today, you know, it's really easy for us to go and say, you know, you know, confess with me, Jesus is Lord. And I've done that recently, led people to Jesus. But it is more than just saying a prayer and coming up front in a, in a service or whatever. It is, it is an exchange of authority. I mean, you're literally, the only thing I know to describe it is, turning the car keys of your life over. To him and the fruit of it is obedience it is a test of its lordship but it's not saying it but what doing it obedience y'all this is what's really interesting to me okay in time one of the most interesting things to me and I hope I don't don't open another can of worms God prophesies, not God tells Abraham he's going to be a father of many nations. In Genesis 15, God shows him all the stars. And it says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, here's my question. Did Abraham become a father of many nations in Genesis 15? Huh? No. The blessing, the grace to be a father of many nations was not released in Genesis 15. So we go from 15 all the way to chapter 22 when God says to Abraham, I want you to offer Isaac up. Then all of a sudden, there was this massive test of obedience. And that's why if you, when you read Genesis 22, that's when God's, you'll see this summarization that God's declaring to Abraham. Now I know, and then he says, you will be so the grace for Isaac to be the father of many nations, I mean, was to be the seed through which Abraham was going to be the father of many nations, occurred in Genesis 22 when, God, when Abraham offered him up. That was the test of obedience. The, the, line, the lineage of Abraham would have ended with Isaac there. Oh, he'd have had some more kids, but there wouldn't have been this crazy... Yep. That's why... In the Garden of Gethsemane, 
Jesus was all tempted at all points as we, y'all, but when all of a sudden Jesus going, you know, Father, you know, all things are possible for you. If there's another way, let this cup pass from me. But yet, what? Not my will. Your will be done. When we're dealing with spiritual warfare, we're dealing with absolutes of authority. And y'all, um, to, to walk, I believe this with all my heart, to walk in the fullness of authority in the spiritual realm. These other, all these facets of authority will come in line. And we'll talk about them later. There's other, there's four other types of authority and responses, and they will, it'll go quicker than this. But do y'all understand what I'm getting to? You've got authority. And the question is, how do we respond? In the, in the spiritual realm, in here, What's the type of authority that's crucial? Obedience. And I will say this. And an honor. Well, I haven't showed those other two. Would you say all three equally or is obedience or submission over? In the, uh... in the spiritual realm, obedience is it. That's when uh, that's that because it's time to think or yeah. What did God tell the what did Samuel prophet speak to Saul when Saul sinned? Obedience is what? Well, they all kind of tie in together. I mean, if you like, if you like, submit, you obey, and it's honoring. I mean, it's all. We had to be one of three, which is the one we got to go for. Got to try more time. Oh, what's God saying? That's the crucial thing. What is He saying? Now we could spend a lot of time even going through stuff like the whole thing about Parakue. You know, not willing to hear. You know, just setting it aside. I'll be honest with you. A scary thing to me is if someone says to me, what's God saying? And my response is, I don't know. That's a scary statement. Because it's very possible that, guess what? Number three on the negative side is happening. I'm not, yeah, I'm just sort of I'm just setting it aside. Because if you're not hearing, you're not in faith. But is it possible that you'd be in a situation that was like, like what you just said, like, what's God saying? I don't know. But maybe you feel like you're, maybe it's something like, well, I don't know, like sometimes, sometimes you feel like I struggle to hear God. Or perceive what he's saying, maybe. I, I I think you a lot of times in our modern day um, Christianity that uh, we start talking about hearing God um, just in relationship to big events and stuff like that. I mean, think about it. How many times did God speak to Abraham? How many times did he, in relationship to the destiny he had for him? He said it once. Genesis 15. Now he told him to offer up Isaac in Genesis 22. Or, or, or Joseph. How many times did he speak to Joseph? He was going to be a ruler. Gave him a couple dreams. So, you know, God gives us these words, and we'll have a tendency to set aside. God told me in 1986, okay, sell out and go into business. And, and he, he said to me, he says, I'm, um, 
go and you'll be successful in business and and uh, and declare Jesus to the next generation. Well, guess what? I'm still doing that. And I'm leaving for the first one, you know, but, you know, so I mean, how many, you know, there's a bunch of times, there's a bunch of smaller words he spoke, but in between there, but that, that large word dictates the direction of my life way back. But there's a lot of it, Q, is my sheep follow me because they, they hear my voice. But then there's a lot of it that is Romans 12, too. Do not be conformed to this world. Be what? Transformed. By the renewing your mind. That you may be able to prove and test what the will of God is. So you're, you're discerning a whole lot more about the circumstances and situations. So it's not just hearing his voice. You're discerning what the Spirit's doing and saying. In seeing, seeing, hearing, and feeling. So, anyway, I mean, here, and I know it's big, and I know you don't want to get there, but do you understand what we've said up to this point? If you summarized it up, and it's a transfer of authority. Because we're here, we're under the authority of Satan, and we're obedient to sin. We're slaves of sin. So that's our Lord. We always don't have a choice to not be a demon. I mean, that's just, that's our default is being a demon. Before. Correct. Do you remember when Jesus, the disciples asked Jesus, and he asked him about, they asked him about faith, and he told them, he starts telling a parable about a servant. I, I, you remember it? I was in Luke. I think it's in Luke eighteen. Uh, you remember it? Luke chapter seventeen. I said eighteen and seventeen, verse five. This this always kind of confused me, but notice what it says. The apostle said to Jesus, "Increase our faith." Luke 17, 5. And the Lord said to them, if you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you would say this mulberry tree be uprooted, you know, and planted and cast in it, but it would obey you. Okay, there's obey. Which of you, having a slave plowing or tending sheep? Now, remember, the question is, increase our faith. Which would... You have a slave plowing or tending sheep. Will you say to him when he has come in from the field, come in immediately and sit down and eat? It, but will he not say to him, prepare me something to eat properly, clothe yourself and serve me while I eat and drink and afterwards you may eat. And he does not thank his slave because he's done the things which were commanded, does he? So too, when he you do all the things which are commanded to you, say... We are unworthy saves. We've only done which we ought to have done. That's all in the context of increase our faith. So what are he saying? Be, be what? Obedient. Be obedient. I mean, it's awesome to be obedient. It is. Father God, we just come, Lord, before you, Lord, and thank you, Lord, for, Lord, just got, Lord, another night. We just, Lord, gather, God, Lord, together, God, Lord, as a family, God, Lord, just, Lord, just, Lord, here, Lord, your word, Lord, gathering, God, Lord, this teaching, God, Lord, just, um, Lord, thank you, Lord, for showing us, God, Lord, just, Lord, great, Lord, and marvelous things, God, Lord, from your word. God, we just pray, let this word just, Lord, be sealed, God, Lord, in our hearts, and God, may we just, Lord, respond, God, Lord, to you, God, with submission, obedience, God, Lord, honor. And God, may we just, um, and let it, God, Lord, just let it be, Lord, from the heart. Lord, from the heart, God. So we just, Lord, thank you, Lord. May you just um, protect us, Lord, as we're going out. Um, and we bless you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Can I show, just say this to you where we're going? Types of authority, husband, wife, children, um, religious leaders, government, work. You need a bigger whiteboard. 